The God Insane Short Story English Bloody Shahab said softly but with an intensity he had never known earlier Damn it! Bloody! He was not very sure of his expletives in English but he preferred not to curse her in Urdu a language he had always used to sing her praises in. How she can do this? How she can say this? Me okay. But how she can say this for him? Far into the distance, the bell of the clock tower announced the cessation of an hour and the birth of another. Are so late? He thought. Late? For him? Perhaps, yes. But for most others, sound asleep, who would start getting up soon and going about their business for the day, these were early hours. He was angry, though he would not accept so himself. He had spent the night in the courtyard, sitting, standing, walking around, lying down, restless constantly. It was a momentous night for him. He could feel the foreboding, the immense weight of the decision he must make today. The point of no return that he must pass today. But he was not really aware of it, at least not yet. He was too busy heaping invective upon his mother. Never she could have anybody close to me. Always, always, I should be her property. Only her bloody property. So, I am her slave. No, I am her dog. She had always taken a great care of him and loved him a great deal. But he insisted that any good dog is given enough good food, good exercise, good training and good health care. In short, great care and great love and also is kept on a leash. Never she can think of me as human being, a separate, a, a, a equal human being. For everything I must look to her. For everything I must beg her. Ha! Fu! With a strange male violence, a male violence strange in him, he spat on the ground. When did she allow me to be close to anybody? She always wants to be my god. Perhaps she always did want to be a little god controlling his destiny. Perhaps he was right. She always found everybody except herself not good enough for her son. In their household, it was always the two of them. Anybody else was welcome only as a guest or as a servant. Relatives and friends he could not get close to because they were only guests here today, gone tomorrow. Back again only after a long time. Time long enough to get the budding intimacy moldy. Servants, it would be clear, were servants only. What with a lordly manner, reminiscent of the ways of Zamindars, the feudal lords. Excuse me. They, or rather she, belong to a conservative and peripherally aristocratic family of a pea-sized principality, Shampur, which had till recently its own indigenous, at least by then indigenous, Nawab governing it. The power was gone 
the prestige going, but the zeitgeist among the old guard was still the same. Not being able to stomach it, in her youth she had become a rebel. Though now she had invested so much of her time in walking the tightrope between conformity and rebellion, she may not agree. She was not a liberal. Rebels never are. She was a radical. Believed that she would take the world by a storm. And later realizing that she did not, she wished her son to do for her all that she could not do. She was a very passionate woman and with all her energy she drove her son towards her goals. Quite obviously he always fell short. Even more obviously since the motivation was external and not internal his prime goal quite regardless of hers would be to get through to get through and do only that which would keep her off his back. He would often succeed, sometimes not. Gradually he learned his lessons. To not find out or to find out wrongly or worst, to find out and not do as she wished would earn him retribution. Swift and hard. She would stop talking to him. He insists that he has not known a greater terror. And perhaps he is right here too. A child, even a man, does not like his lifeline threatened. Nobody to trust, nobody to turn to, and with the sole physical and emotional link with life under threat, few people desirous of living would have the guts to remain calm and not give in. He had not the courage, so he did, or at least tried to do, as she wished. When to bathe, whom to meet, how to talk, where to sit, how much to eat, in short, for what to do, believe, think, and perhaps even feel, he turned towards her. And she never returned him empty-handed. Even as he grew self-reliant physically, she desired his dependence upon her. He was expected to inform her before he went to the toilet lest she might call him and not getting a reply get disturbed. All his major decisions had to be ratified by her before he could think of them as decided. Even minor things were more welcome if she were a part of the decision. The bigger he grew, the more empty he became. As insecure and mixed up as she was, he proceeded to become. For her, the momentary appeal to her sentiment carried the greatest weight. It was a consistent policy and led her to believe that she was more genuine than others. Since he did not have that sentiment available to him directly, he became an uncanny judge of his mother's moods. He found the best policy was to be submissive, and she later railed at him for not being manly enough in his dealings with the rickshaw pullers and later with his wife. I forgive her everything, everything, damn it. She made a kachumar out of me, 
and I do not complain. She used me like fodder for her monster ego. Giant, certainly, but perhaps not monstrous, for it was a paper giant. All the time, she says she wants only love. I give love. What love, she asks? All my life, I give proof, proof, proof. Still, no proof. Whatever she said, I did all my life. What she wants now? What? She did what she wanted with Ghazala. No, not with Abbas. No. Ghazala was a girl he had got married to about a year or so back. Girl she was, despite the marriage. But let's leave her there and rewind a little bit. He had grown up, finished his education and started working for a set in the city nearby. All his relatives and friends then started exhorting him to get married, to fulfill his duty as a human being, to give comfort to his aging and ailing mother to achieve the sunnah, the tradition of the Prophet. If he had ever gone with any of his friends who were bad enough to go womanizing, as the popular sport was known, if he could visualize women as anything but mothers and mommies and bhabis, he would have known what it meant to get excited, to fall in love, to make love and to get married. Or perhaps I am putting the cart before the horse. Anyway, like the veritable good boy his mother and relatives expected him to be, he was. He was. How was he to know that double standards come as naturally to these people as the later said, love for women should come to him. He assented for marriage and the ceremony was duly completed. The girl, Ghazala, was a nice and simple girl, as good as good girls there were expected to be. The wedding night and every subsequent night, the bedroom door closed behind them and opened only in the morning. But let us leave it closed. On the eighth day, Shahab said he had been allowed only a week's leave and he must go back to Rampur, the city, his place of work. Promising that he would be back on Sunday, he left for the bus stand, which stood a few hundred yards east of his mother's house. The bus was already there and surprisingly did have some sitting room. He kept his airbag on a seat and went to the ticket window to get his ticket. As he returned to the bus after buying the ticket, he saw Abbas, the teenage son of the new postmaster, postmaster sahib, euphemism for the lone postman who manned the local mockery of a post office fidgeting by the broken gate of the bus stand. Are Abbas, yaha kya kar rahe ho? Oh, Abbas, what are you doing here? Ji, kuch nahi, khada hoon. Oh, nothing, I'm just standing here. Abbas seemed a bit embarrassed. Shahab had also noticed him on many other occasions, standing by the bus stand, when he took the early morning bus back to Rampur. The bus honked and an embarrassing moment later, he said, Khuda Hafiz, goodbye, Khuda Hafiz. Shahab was back on Sunday and left early next morning, 
several weeks went by and adapt always at inventing excuses he kept life on an even keel how ghazala spent her days not many knew but as yet nobody had found anything to complain about her one sunday in june postma sahab came to meet shahab after the usual dua salam he informed our man that that year abbas had finished his matriculation which shahab knew he further informed that abbas had been able to get admission to the rampur college which also he knew would he be so kind as to take abbas with him and arrange accommodation for him at rampur that was postmaster's way of requesting shahab to allow abbas to stay with him in his dingy little room there the room was actually a small dilapidated portion of a once grandiose mansion which did not have a roof anymore but this small room did have one the mansion legacy of a grand uncle it constituted of a coterie which in their heyday was used as a grain store part of the zanana it had never had a proper flooring and was now leaky in the roof as well the saving grace was that all four walls were intact and the roof was still 15 feet above the ground apart from the coterie there was a baramda a veranda and a vast dalan an open courtyard which once boasted of the highest compound wall in the now ghost suburb of the town the courtyard had overgrown with weeds and was home to several reptiles rodents and the like in monsoons staying in the house was a positive hazard especially since the nearest neighbors stayed half a mile away but there was no choice accommodation in the city proper was very costly and beyond his means Postmaster knew all this and was still hoping that Shahab would offer Abbas a place to stay for Postmaster earned even lesser than Shahab Shahab did offer and after the usual nos and nothings Postmaster glowing with admiration and gratitude hurried home to inform his wife of their good fortune excuse me abbas left the next day with shahab for rampur as they reached rampur monsoons broke over the city and by the time they reached their new home they were drenched to the bone the courtyard was flooded and the room was leaky all over except in the corner where shahab had placed his cot which is the reason why he had placed it there they found dry places for their things and dry clothes for themselves and then got into their bed no no nothing to get excited about at least not yet cots and beds being in short supply that was then the most natural thing to do for any two men or any two women from their cultural milieu and of course there was no other furniture in the room the bed was only warm place and that's the only place they could sit huddled together waiting for the rain to abate but it did not it rained all day and shahab could not even go to his work it rained all night too the likes of which neither had seen earlier lesser rains were known to have brought rampur city to a grinding halt and this place was built in this luckily for them 
they could find some homemade biscuits in the stuff Abbas had brought from his home. The next day dawned and it was still raining. Abbas was miserable. This was the last day of reporting. If his admission card was not deposited at the principal's office today, his admission would be revoked and the seat offered to another candidate. Up until noon, when there was no sign of the rain letting up, Shahab, who had to miss work this day as well, then decided to go himself alone to the principal's office for the deposition. Packing the card neatly in four plastic bags, one inside the other, he clutched at his broken umbrella and left. He was gone seven hours, and when he returned, Abbas was already half dead with fright. But all was well, the office had not been opened, so he had to find the principal's residence and hand over the card to him in person. Wet and tired, Shahab put on his pajamas and got into the bed. But soon he was feeling colder and started shivering. Abbas piled on him every dry cloth he could lay his hands on and still Shahab was shivering. Slowly his consciousness started slipping. Abbas was panicky by now. There was nothing he could think of doing. He thought and thought and thought and suddenly an idea. He remembered a scene from a Hindi movie. Hero and heroine are stuck in a small cottage up a hill and it is raining. Raining or snowing? He did not remember. Heroine is very ill. She has fever. Was it fever? Anyway, she was losing consciousness. So to save her, Hero has to take some drastic measures. He starts taking off his clothes. Stacking his clothes neatly on top of the already high pile of clothes, bed clothes and blankets on Shahab, Abbas got inside. Slowly he reached for the kamarband. By the next evening Shaham was well. But the rain continued for another week. Bloody! How she can say such words? I am blackening my face with the bus. First she kicks out Ghazala. Now she wants me to marry again. You want child? I do not. I do not want to marry anybody. I love Abbas. I say to everybody, everywhere, bloody. He fumed. After the arrival of Abbas to Rampur, Shahab's visit to Shampur had sharply reduced. Shahab and Abbas were happy together and in this state of bliss several months had gone by. Mother on the other hand was deeply unhappy. As of late Shahab had started ignoring her commands and sometimes even talked back at her. Ghazala had done the same. On one day when Shahab was home mother asked him to deposit Ghazala back at her Maika, that is her father's place. She had certain accusations to make about her and an ex-classmate who lived nearby. What his reactions were inside him we do not know, but he complied. As time passed, mother wanted another Bahu, another daughter-in-law, and she would continuously pester him for that. He reduced his trips further. 
But in the meantime, Abbas completed his first year of studies at the college and returned to Shampur for the summer vacations. Shahab found Rampur too drab and disenchanting without Abbas and the third day found him in Shampur. The next two weeks wore him out like never before. His mother seized her chance. What was worse was that she had recruited the services of her kin. Nowhere could Shahab go without being informed of his mother's and his own need for another dulhan, another bride. People told him what he should do. People told him what he should feel. People told him what he should desire. But he was lucky he had a bus. Early in the morning, at the time of Fajr prayers, they would meet at the mosque and later go on long walks which would bring them back only in the afternoon. That gave him strength to see the day through. One day, just as he was thinking that the worst was over, he found himself face to face with a panel of elders who grilled him for hours on certain aspects of his life. One of them, himself unseen, had seen the lovers in a field this morning, and it seemed as if the world was on fire. Though not being accustomed to speaking of such matters openly, they could only approach the outrage in very oblique ways. The meeting had to be terminated to an early inconclusion because of a certain Netaji, a political leader, who had arrived at Shampur unannounced and then everybody wanted to be in his presence rather than in anybody else's. Excuse me. Back at home, his mother wanted to know why he had been so unconvincing in his replies. Shahab, with a poetic bent of mind, had quoted, Kisi ko apne amal ka hisab kya dete? Kisi ko apne amal ka hisab kya dete? Sawal sare hi galat the. Sawal sare hi galat the. Jawab kya dete? Of my actions, what accounts could I give? Of my actions, what accounts could I give? Questions were wrong all. What answers could I give? It was her unpoetic reply which had kept him awake all night. I take a bus and go from here. I will never come back. Could he leave his mother and never see her face again? Could he do it? Would Abbas agree to leave everybody and everything for him? Would they be happy together? Would they face no other problems elsewhere? Was it all he would ever want from life? Such questions did not occur to him. I guess I think too much. A deer fleeing a lion would not stop to ponder over the fact that one day it has to die anyway. Perhaps it is better to aim for the sky rather than not at all. One may not reach it but can touch the ra rainbow perhaps. The thoughts he had had now quietened his nerves. He sat down for a minute, closed his eyes. The call to God, the morning azan startled him. It was the time for Fajr. 
he got up, went to the bath, reached for the bucket and performed his ablutions. Then he wrote a brief note to his mother. Collecting a few necessary things, he entered into his mother's room softly. Keeping the note on the bedside table, he turned towards his mother. For a minute he kept looking and then abruptly he turned around and left. Outside the gate, he looked towards the mosque and beyond it, the bus stand. A bus he knew would be ready to leave in a few minutes time after namaz. He smiled to himself, confident in the first decision that was his own. He took a self-assured step towards the sun that would soon rise to welcome him.